have started our study of the book of Daniel, but in the initial period of our study, it is important that we go slowly. And so once again, I call your attention so that we'll be familiar with chapter 1 of Daniel. And this morning, I call your attention to it once again as we observe all these important informations and lessons once again from Daniel chapter 1. Daniel lived in a time like ours. In fact, he lived in a time more difficult than ours. He was forcefully removed from his society and his country, and he found himself in an unbelieving society. He found himself in a strange world where he had to learn a new language and a new custom. And he found himself unable to compromise what he has been taught about God. And out of his love for God, we are learning here in chapter 1 how he requested that he fear God and continue to be faithful to the God he has been serving, even though he has been forcefully taken away and learning a new language and a culture in a foreign land. And so let me read for you as to the events that took place in the life of Daniel. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with some of the articles of the house of God, which he carried into the land of Shena, to the house of his God. And he brought the articles into the treasure house of his God. Then the king instructed Espetes, the master of his eunuchs, to bring some of the children of Israel, and some of the king's descendants, and some of the nobles, young men, in whom there was no blemish, but good-looking, gifted in all wisdom, possessing knowledge, and quick to understand, who had ability to serve in a king's palace, and whom we might teach the language and literature of the Chaldeans. And the king appointed for them a daily provision of the king's delicacies and of the wine which he drank, and three years of training for them, so that at the end of that time they might serve before the king. Now before, from among those of the sons of Judah were Daniel, Ananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. To them the chief of the eunuchs gave names. He gave Daniel the name Belshazzar, to Hananiah Shidrach, and to Mishael Meshach, and to Azariah Abednego. But Daniel purpose in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's delicacies nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore he requested of the chief of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Now God had brought Daniel into the favor and goodwill of the chief of the eunuchs. And the chief of the eunuchs said to Daniel, I fear, I fear my lord the king who has appointed your food and drink. For why should he see your faces looking worse than the young men who are your age? Then, he would then you would endanger my head before the king. So Daniel said to the steward, whom the chief of the eunuchs had said before, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, Please test your servants for ten days, and let them give us vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then let our appearance be examined before you, and the appearance of the young men who eat the portion of the king's delicacies. And as you see fit, so deal with your servants. So he consented with them in this matter, and tested them ten days. And at the end of the ten days, their features appeared better and fatter in flesh than all the young men who ate the portion of the king's delicacies. Thus the steward took away their portion of delicacies 
and the wine that they were to drink, and gave them vegetables. As for these four young men, God gave them knowledge and skill in all literature and wisdom. And Daniel had understanding in all dreams, visions and dreams. And so we are told, my beloved brothers and sisters, in our reading here, the context for which you find Daniel in Babylon. There were three deportations during this period of time of people forcefully taken away from their homeland to Babylon. In the year 605, in the year 597, and in the year 586 BC. The events recorded here appears to be events surrounding the year, the last deportation, 586, 586 BC. Daniel was among those who were taken into exile. And there he was, you find, serving the Lord in a foreign land, remaining faithful to God. He did not say, since you did not protect me, why should I continue to believe in you? Daniel never had this attitude. Daniel's genuine faith in God continued on, up or down, as you will in the coming weeks learn of how difficult it was for Daniel to trust in God, how he was constantly being observed and how the non-Christians found fault with him and endangered his life so many times and how the Lord preserved Daniel and his companions. There are three lessons remaining that I would like to draw your attention to before we move on to the other chapters of Daniel. The first lesson is this, brothers and sisters, in this portion that I've just read for you. I hope that you do not fail to learn that disobedience will be punished by God. Disobedience to God will be punished. That is the obvious lesson that you are learning here in the, in the situation that Daniel faced. You see, the ancient people of God had been warned multiple times through the years that sin against God will be punished. Shortly after they left Egypt, when they received the laws of God from Mount Sinai, in the time of Moses, this is what the Lord had already told the people. Sin will be punished. Disobedience will not be tolerated. And so if you turn with me to Deuteronomy <coughs> chapter 28, look at what it is clearly taught to them there. Deuteronomy 28 and verse 15. But it shall come to pass, if you do not obey the voice of the Lord your God, to observe carefully all His commandments and His statutes, which I command you today, that all these curses will come upon you and overtake you. I want you to pause, and I purposely read it slowly for you to observe, that the words of Moses is very clear. I don't know why Christians today think that they do not need to obey God and it's okay. When it is clearly taught to you here that if you do not obey the voice of the Lord your God to observe carefully all His commandments and His statutes which I command you today that all these curses will come upon you and overtake you. Why do you think that you can disobey God and that everything will continue to be okay? That when you pray, God will listen to you and that your life will continue to be well and happy. It cannot be, brothers and sisters. No wonder your life is faced with difficulties. No wonder 
you are not happy in your life. No wonder your relationship is giving you misery and headaches. Could it be, brothers and sisters, you are encountering difficulties at this very moment with your families, at your workplace, with your health, and with your life, and as a society in Singapore, because you have not carefully observed the teaching of the Bible? When it says, observe carefully all His commandments and His statutes, it implies that you need to know His Word because it is in His Word that you find His commandments and statute clearly recorded for you. How dare you not read the Bible regularly and think that you are living well? How dare you think that you are living like a Christian when you are never regularly reminded in your conscience as to the commandments and the statutes of God. And therefore, if you have not read the Bible regularly, I'm sorry to tell you, you have already sinned against the Lord, because you have not. Whatever excuses or whatever you bluff yourself with, you have not observed carefully all His commandments and all His statutes. And so, you must repent. The mention here is made of the curses that will come upon you. And you find, brothers and sisters, that the Lord says that He will use military defeat and exile to punish His people if they will not repent from their sin. If we turn again to Deuteronomy 28, the same chapter, look there, brothers and sisters, at verse 25. The Lord will cause you to be defeated before your enemies. You shall go out one way against them and flee seven ways before them. You shall become troublesome to all the kingdoms of the earth. So here you are clearly told you will, feel you will face defeat. You go out. United as an army, you march out in one way to face your enemies. And then how come it becomes seven ways? It means you may be united and you think you are strong, you are able to defeat and you are able to resist your enemy. But by the time you face your enemy, you are all running all away, you are fleeing, you are escaping in different direction. That is the picture, picture that God wants you to see. And then you become exiles. You are people who find yourself distributed, escaping to all the kingdoms of the earth. Further down go, brothers and sisters, and look at verse 64. Deuteronomy 28, 64 says, Then the Lord will scatter you among all people from one end of the earth to the other, and there you shall serve other gods which neither you nor your fathers have known, wood and stone. And that's exactly what had happened in the time of Daniel. That he would be scattered like many others and he would be introduced to different gods and made to mention the name of all these gods, gods of statues made of wood and stone. You find, brothers and sisters, that the, minutes, the same message is being issued to you by the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 6 and verse 23 says, For the wages of sin is death. Why Christians like to talk about sin? Why you come to church on Sunday, you hear nothing but the pastor talking about sin, about repentance, about turning away from the world? Well, brothers and sisters, because the world will not tell you that. Because this is a message you will not read about in the newspaper. And the, 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 the television, the show that you watch, the world will not tell you about all these things. 
And so you may live in a life and think that these things are not important. When they are of supreme importance, because you can see it happening in the time of Daniel, God used Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, to punish the nation of Judah in the time of their king called Jehoiakim. Jehoiakim was a very wicked king. So wicked that God had to put an end. If not, the whole nation would be destroyed. The Lord Jesus Christ tells you, brothers and sisters, that unless you repent of your sin, unless you return to God in seriousness, you will also perish like them. If you turn with me to the Gospel of Luke chapter 13, to in two places here in Luke 13, verse 3 and verse 5, you find the Lord Jesus Christ issuing this warning. The people were wondering about the destruction of sinners. And twice the Lord Jesus Christ reminded them, in verse 3 it says, Unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. You find the same words repeated in verse 5. Unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. If God punished people in ancient time for sin, and you are doing the same sin, you can be sure that you will be punished too. Don't be like Adam and Eve. A lot of people point to Adam and say, God says, surely you shall die. But Adam didn't die. Adam went to live on for a few hundred years before he died. And so a lot of people say, ah, you shall surely die doesn't mean you will die immediately. You can go on for a few hundred years. The point is this. At the end of the day, Adam still died. But immediately when Adam sinned against God, Adam died spiritually. He no longer has communion with God. He no longer has eternal life with God until he repents. Therefore, my beloved brothers and sisters, do not think that God has not punished you and therefore you are okay. You find the same message being proclaimed by the prophets of God throughout human history. Sin is the root problem of human misery and suffering. Human suffers. Human have miseries. Why? The root problem is sin. You are a wicked person because of your sin. It is sin that causes you to be wicked and rebelling against God. And unless you repent of your sin and unless God helps you and save you from your sin, sin will eventually eat you up and cause you to die. I often use the example of a driver. When a driver refuses to follow traffic rules on the road, the driver will cause traffic accidents, deaths, and injuries to himself and to others who are using the road. You see, the road is only safe if all drivers strictly follow the traffic regulations. If you follow the traffic regulations, but others try drivers do not, you will likewise face danger, accident and death. So similarly in this world, you cannot say that my father and mother, they are following God's law, and are so therefore I do not need to. You are like the traffic, the driver in a, on the road. Others may be obeying traffic regulations, but if you don't, you are going to cause people to die, and yourself to die too one day. 
Therefore, my beloved brothers and sisters, observe this one thing, that unless you, every one of you deal with sin, sin will continue to cause you to be miserable and will eventually take your life away from you. The world is becoming worse and worse. Why? Look! Because the world is increasingly sinful and rebellious. What do you expect? If you continue to rebel, you continue to be sinful, what is the result? The world will become worse and worse a place for you to live. And that is increasingly so, brothers and sisters. As you look around you, you find that in many places, the warning has already been given. Please, if you are a Singaporean, the Singapore government tell you, don't go to these places for your holiday. Because you may lose your life. It used to be possible to go to Iran, to Lebanon. Now in Lebanon, there is only one Singaporean who is refusing to leave. The Singapore government has written to every Singaporean who used to be there on business and social reasons, all left except this one stubborn person. <coughs> because war is coming. The second lesson I want to draw your attention to before we move on to other chapters of Daniel is this. You find that God works sovereignly, often invisibly to the eyes of human beings, but sovereign, nonetheless, sovereignly in control of the world. After conquering the southern kingdom of Judah, you have just read, I have just read for you, Nebuchadnezzar ordered the deportation of the brightest young people of Judah. That is what you are told. Look there in verse 3, the verse 4 of Daniel chapter 1. How young men in whom there was no blemish, but good looking, gifted in all wisdom, that means smart people, possessing knowledge and quick to understand, who had ability to serve the king's palace. They were taken away. In other words, brothers and sisters, the modern word to describe what's happening here is called a brain drain. A brain drain. That's always been the practice of more powerful nations. When you send your children overseas to a country to study, if they prove themselves to be smart and to be skillful, you realize that that country will in many ways try to retain them and keep them in their country and offer them a lot of things in order to entice them to remain there. Why? We're alone here. This has been always the case because of this brain drain that the King Nebuchadnezzar, you find that he was also practicing during his time. The purpose of this Babylonian policy is to strip Judah of its brightest people and at the same time benefit Babylon by adding these gifted people to the empire. This is what human beings see in such a human policy and a human plan. The conquerors take the best for themselves. But brothers and sisters, if you look at the same situation, but now differently, from the point of view of the Word of God, you realize that you have a different perspective altogether. The Babylonian, they see the conqueror getting the best. They see a brain drain. But if you look at what the Word of God wants you to see, you find that God is working invisibly through the actions of human beings. God was at work in the use of the Babylonian conquest of Judah. The Babylonians saw the invasion of Judah. But God wants you to see the divine invasion of Babylon. 
so I hope you do not forget that God has a hand in all these things. The Muslim Ottoman Empire started to invade Europe between the year 1354 and 1526. It was a long period of war. The Muslim fighting the Roman Catholic Europe. And so it was from the year 1354 AD to the year 1526 when ultimately the Muslim Empire was conquered by the Catholic. During this period of time, it's a long period of many years, the Holy Roman Empire and the Roman Catholic Church, they were very occupied by this Muslim invasion of Europe. And so they put all their brains and their resources together to deal with this, to defend Europe, to push the Ottoman uh, soldiers away. And they had no time left to deal with what was happening in the part of Northern Europe in a place where it is known as Wittenberg in Germany, where the Protestant Reformation started in 1517, right at a period of time when the Ottoman Muslim Empire was expanding into Europe. That's why the Protestant Reformation succeeded, and it was barely being uh, uh, pressed down by the mighty uh, civil leaders of the time. You see, God was using all these historical events to fulfill His will. So it was in the time of Daniel, God wanted to punish the disobedient people of Judah, and God used the mighty Babylonian to do so. Today, you find the fall of Sheikh Hasina in Bangladesh. And just last year, you saw the uprising in Sri Lanka, which resulted in the, in the overthrow of the, the corrupt government in Sri Lanka because of corruption and nepotism. And currently, in the last few weeks, I'm sure you have been disturbed by the politics at the Paris Olympic Games, as well as the violence and the war in Gaza and Ukraine. And you are wondering what's happening. How should I understand all these things happening around the world? Is God still God? Is God in control? Well, when you look at the life of Daniel, you learn that God is sovereignly in control. Though invisible to your naked eyes. God is God and He's allowing things to happen because ultimately there is a purpose for Him and for the good of His church. God is God. If you turn to Daniel chapter 2, remember what Daniel said in Daniel chapter 2 verses 20 to 22. Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, for wisdom and might are His, and He changes the times and the seasons. He removes kings and raises up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. He reveals deep and secret things. He knows what is in the darkness and light dwells with him. What a sovereign God Daniel served. And it is this same God that God, that the same God that you should serve. And Daniel is calling your attention to this. Don't look at him being forcefully taken away from his family and loved ones. Don't look at him as I also put him suffering so far away in in another part of the world. Don't say he has to learn a new language. He has to learn new things. Don't say that. Rather, learn from Daniel himself. Because Daniel knows that like every other human beings, our life on earth is so short. After all, we are only God's servants in this world. Sooner or later, we will also be taken away. 
It is more important that you know God and see a purpose for your own lives in God's hand. Trust in the invisible hand of God in your lives. Things may be happening in your school, the change of your teachers, the students, and the curriculums, the policies in our land. Things may be happening around us, causing us to be fearful of our jobs. But brothers and sisters, ultimately, you must believe that God will punish sin and that He will take care of His people at the same time. What I have just shared with you, I hope, to bring the third point, the final point this morning to your attention, and that is this, that you can look at the world from the world point of view, the point of view from the world, or from the Bible's perspective of the world. The same event, you can understand in two different perspectives. You can see the world as the world wants you to see it, or you should, because you are a Christian who loves the Word of God, interpret and see the world from the perspective of God. This is what is called a Christian worldview. A Christian worldview. In other words, a Christian look at the world differently from the world looking at the world. And that is what you need to learn from Daniel. Daniel didn't look at the world and say, I am a defeated, I'm defeated, the Babylonian war, they conquered my country, ah, I'm now a prisoner of war. Daniel didn't go to Babylon in that frame of mind. He went there and he knows that God has a calling for him to be in a new place and he was going there to serve the Lord, whatever it is. You see, your Christian worldview answers basic questions like, who am I? Why am I in the world today, at this point in history? Where am I going after this? Why is this happening today? The Christian worldview will provide you with an answer for all these questions. Your Christian worldview is how you give meaning to what you are seeing around you and in your life at the moment. The Christian sees and understands the world differently from others. But the world is pressurizing you. The world is pressurizing you to adopt the perspective of the world. I even there, brothers and sisters, you realize that to the newspaper today, the news media today, they are pressurizing you that you must see the world as they report from a Western perspective. That Russia is always the wicked one, that China is always the wicked one, that America is always the good guy. And therefore, brothers and sisters, you realize that you have been pressurized you have been brainwashed, you have been always being fed all this depending on who is in control of the media. But we should not be controlled by the Western media or the Eastern media. We are Christians. We should be controlled by the Word of God. We interpret the world from a Christian perspective. And that is why it is good, brothers and sisters, Instead of listening to Channel New Asia or instead of listening to the news from China or from anywhere else, listen, there are many Christian news media. Turn on, it's free of charge now instead of YouTube, YouTube, YouTube. Turn on to this news media and listen, every day they will have news from a Christian perspective. And many of these people are good people, reformed pastors, Reform Christians from a Christian perspective. There is even Christian newspaper. In, in England, you have the Evangelical Times. Newspaper published a few times a week. They cannot publish it every day because it's of financial uh, limitation, but a few times a week. In America, you have World Today, the World Magazine. 
which is published very regularly from a Christian perspective to tell you from how a Christian should look at what is happening around the world rather than from any cultural or civilization that uh, the wants to, to control your thinking. Currently, the world wants you to believe that a person can be a male or a female up to your choice. In fact, it is very increasingly annoying for me and, it, and, uh, and it's very sad that uh, many news media has adopted this as well. Brothers and sisters, the boxer from Algeria, whatever his birth certificate may say, if you have a chromosome XY, you are born a myth. Do not listen to all these nonsensical people to tell you, oh, but he's, she is born this way. What do you mean by you are born this way? Yeah, you are born this way, correct. You are born a male. Mm -hmm. The same thing for the Taiwanese boxer. The Taiwanese wants you to know, but he has always, she has always been uh, uh, involved in, in boxing in a female league. So, take a blood test. If you have XY, you are a male. But you see, the world is trying to change your perspective. The world is telling you, don't use blood tests. Use your passport. If your passport says male, means male. Female means female. I have to bring this. My wife is telling me I'm just so absorbed by all these things here. But brothers and sisters, it's relevant for our sermon. Because the world is pressurizing you to look at the world from their perspective. But you are a Christian, you must be convinced that I don't follow the world. I follow God. God made every man, male or female, at birth. And He has indeed given sign, sexual sign of a man, sexual sign of a woman, as also blood tests. The chromosome for a man, chromosome for a woman. You know, brothers and sisters, Increasingly, it is impossible when you go to America and interview a college student, a young person, and ask the person, define a woman. Many of the American young people will turn to you and say, I cannot. I cannot define a woman. They cannot even define and say what is a woman. And that is very frightening and sad, isn't it? But all these things that a Christian is facing today, my beloved brothers and sisters, is not new. Because Daniel had faced all these same challenges. Daniel was facing the pressure from society, from the leaders of the empire and to conform. Even here in chapter 1, he was forced to eat the food and to drink the drink. Daniel had to put up a resistance, not because he is rebellious, but because he loved the Lord and he will not compromise. Daniel was living in a very pagan society. And therefore, brothers and sisters, take courage and take the example of Daniel for yourself. The name Daniel in Hebrew means, Daniel means, God is my judge. God is my judge. Daniel sought to live in the presence of God. Conscious that ultimately God is the judge of his life. Therefore, my beloved brothers and sisters, as you live your life, do not leave it to please the world. Do not leave it to please someone else. But live your life with a clear conscience. Live it in the presence of God, who is your judge. And remember, the name of your judge is the name of your Savior too. Because the Lord Jesus Christ is the appointed judge when the day of judgment is come. So make peace with Him, know Him, and let Him save you in whatever situation you may face 
in your journey through this world. And so you learn this from chapter 1, as we will soon go on to the other chapters of Daniel. That disobedience will be punished. And therefore, brothers and sisters, take sin seriously. Don't be foolish. Don't think that if you take sin lightly, it will blow away. It will not. If you commit adultery, you can be sure that you will damage your marriage. It will. Don't think of all those shows or whatever story you hear that the spouse is so forgiving and turn a blind eye like Jack Neal's wife. You do not know what's happening in Jack Neal's life. But you can be sure sin will break relationship and break the marriage. And others as well. Live a holy life. And may God preserve us as His people. Let us pray.